My name's uh, Judith Lacey and I'm the head of the Supportive Care and Integrative Oncology program here at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. This is part of our Living Well with Cancer webinar series. This is a webinar series that was created last year and coordinated by Andy Hampson, who's hiding uh, behind the L5 boardroom sign. And um, we really, the aim of this is to really inform people uh, about what it is, what integrative oncology is and the benefits of some of the therapies that we offer and our approach to care that can really improve the lives of people living with cancer. Our, our program sits in the living room and is also um, provided around the hospital. Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, as you know, is a comprehensive cancer Hospital and integrative oncology and supportive care is an integral part of that care. That includes the delivery of not only uh, touch therapies like massage reflexology, but also acupuncture, yoga one-on-one -on -one therapy, yoga group therapies, exercise, mind-body practice such as mindfulness and of course yoga, and um, uh, as well as a quite a strong focus on research, education, medical and nursing care. And so today we're going to be looking at um, yoga and the benefits of yoga uh, for people living with cancer and living after cancer. There's a, this is a highly uh, studied uh, therapy and we'll hear a little bit more about the research behind why it's so important to include yoga into our cancer care delivery. Most integrative oncology services nowadays have a yoga component. And if you walk down the street anywhere in Sydney, you'll find a yoga school. And um, you'll hear a little bit uh, today about the what, what is unique about yoga, uh, the yoga that we provide for cancer patients. So I'd like to start off by, now this isn't in place of uh, medical care and these are the views of our practitioners and not necessarily all the views of Lifehouse. So I'm gonna introduce our three speakers today and I'll be facilitating. First is Marjorie Hellman. Margie is a certified uh, yoga therapist and registered occupational therapist. She's been teaching yoga at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse since 2014. She has over 25 years experience in healthcare service and private practice, supporting individuals to find freedom of movement, well-being, and peace of mind. She's currently involved in a study looking at the benefits of yoga for the management of lymphedema secondary to breast cancer treatment, and also involved in a study uh, providing uh, therapy for people with uh, anxiety and depression. You'll hear a bit, little bit more about that today. Georgina Green is a life, has a lifelong interest in health science and living your best life. And this interest came together for her when she commenced working in yoga. It was the start of her life's journey that involved extensive studies in Australia and India to become a yoga teacher and yoga therapist. Georgina has also started her professional career in nursing, both here and overseas, and now, infor this informs, now informs her practice and teaching style. This, uh, and this background in healthcare has really enabled her to modify her practice uh, to best benefit patients living with cancer and after cancer. And Maria Gonzalez, Maria is currently our research assistant and is a PhD candidate uh, with Nickham Health Research Institute of Western Sydney University. Maria has a diverse background in medical research, fitness and administration. She completed her Bachelor of Science degree with honours in 2005 and subsequently gained a master's degree where she was investigating the early genetic changes in ovarian cancer. She's acquired a wide variety of experience in projects, event management, research ethics, and science communication. And her research is focused on the evaluation of mental health effects of yoga in people with cancer. And so what we're going to, we'll start with Margie today. And Margie is going to um, really give us a, an understanding of how yoga fits into cancer care, having um, probably the most experience of any of us 
uh, with providing uh, yoga here at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse and will also uh, guide us through an initial practice. Thank you, Margie. Thanks, Judith. Welcome, everybody. So um, I'm just going to speak very briefly before we do our little practice and put yoga therapy in a context. So most people are starting to hear the word yoga therapy now. And, and a yoga therapist, such as Georgina and I, has an extra layer of training to our yoga teacher training. And that is in how to really adapt yoga for people from all walks of life, um, people maybe have never done yoga, certainly people living with cancer during their treatment and, and, and any other health um, concerns. So this is a very different approach to yoga. And it's interesting to understand the context that this was always how yoga was practiced traditionally. Um, yoga, as we know, comes from India and, and it's thousands of years old. So we know that, um, you know, it stood the test of time yoga. But now we have so much, as, as um, Judith was, was saying, we have such an abundance of research now and, and really science to explain this ancient practice that holds so much relevance for us in modern day life. So what I wanted to do is just um, kind of put, put the yoga in cancer care in a bit of a context because most people think of yoga um, as what they see in the media, images of people tying their body in knots that are quite young and fit. And most people will cast yoga off and think, I can't, I can't do yoga, you know, it's, and, and, and maybe that, that's it, they strike it off their list. But here at Lifehouse and in, in cancer care settings all over the world now, we're, we're offering a yoga that is really suitable and, um, 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 available and, and can be adapted to you in, in whatever situation you're at, whether you're having treatment or after treatment into survivorship. So the um, American Society of Clinical Oncology now has recommended yoga as an effective and safe, tr safe approach for people. Um, and what we're really looking at helping you do is helping you work with some of the side effects that you may experience and that many people experience during their treatment, such as fatigue. And Maria will be explaining in more detail the research in these areas. Um, yoga helps us, yoga helps with fatigue. It helps everybody with fatigue, people living with cancer, but people in the modern world. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about the science about that in a moment. It helps with sleep. It helps us with our mood, it helps us feel better physically. So re that relaxation of the body, the release of tension in the body. Um, yoga can help with that kind of chemo brain, the fog that we get that, that's part of cancer treatment. So on multiple levels, because yoga is what we call a mind body approach, right? So what I'm gonna explain to you a little bit because you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot of um, benefits. And how does this work? Because there is a real science to this. And um, it's quite interesting. And what we're gonna do is explore feeling this in the body a little bit. And as we go, I'll explain the science. So yoga um, works by working with our stress response. So the stress response is very much a part of our, how our body evolved and we need it. We need our stress response. It keeps us safe, it protects us, it mobilizes us. But what often happens in modern day life and when you're going through treatment for cancer is the stress response gets switched on and it's hard to switch it off, right? So we know this feeling, we feel tired, it's hard to breathe, mind gets foggy. We all know this feeling of stress. And yoga in essence is a way that we can work directly with our nervous system and learn to modify this response. So we're really learning how to feel our body, feel our breath and change our behavior. So let's have a little go at this right now. And you can, I'll talk you through this. We're just gonna spend a couple minutes working with the breath and doing some very simple movements that are safe for everybody. So what I want you to do is just get comfortable in your chair. And I invite you maybe to close your eyes and just sense your body and make sure that you are comfortable if you need to support your lower back a little bit more, support it. And then I want you just to take a deep breath in. So just, just breathing. We breathe all the time and it's such a powerful tool for helping us work to relax our body and mind. So take a nice deep breath in. And as you exhale, I want you to make a little sound and put your hand right here on your belly and go. 
So what we're doing is we're lengthening the exhale. And so I want you just to try that a few times. You can rest your hand on your belly because I want you to feel some movement there as you breathe. Just breathing in a little bit more and breathing out slowly. So you can open your mouth because you're muted or just think about feeling your breath lengthen. So what's happening here when we work with the breath in this way is we're actually working to dampen down the stress response and to switch on what we call the parasympathetic or the rest and digest. And this is hard science now. We know that we can do this and this is how yoga works. It's quite simple, but we need to practice a little bit. So let me also just briefly demonstrate the physical feeling that we get in yoga because yoga is very much about the body and sensing our body. So what I want you to do now is take a breath in like we just did and tense your shoulders. So this is what happens to us. We can walk around like this all day long. It's telling our brain stress, stress, stress. But if we go, we connect to our body, we let it relax and we breathe out slowly. So just try that a few times for yourself. So breathe in, tense, feel the feeling. You can feel it right through your whole body. It penetrates even your mind state. And then breathe out. So you don't have to make the sound anymore if you don't want to. I just get that so people can really strengthen the feeling of lengthening the out breath. And Georgina will be talking a little bit more about this and bringing a feeling of calm directly to your nervous system. So one last, two last things I wanna say about yoga because I have been teaching at Lifehouse for a while. And one of the things that I love about yoga is it's empowering, right? Because dealing with cancer takes your power. It takes your control away. And by learning some of these simple techniques that you can learn in a one-on-one -on -one session or coming to a group class, you can start to feel like you can help yourself. You can help yourself every day in your home for five or 10 minutes even. So we can show you these techniques. The other, the last thing I wanna say before we hand over to Maria is yoga. Um, a lot of people love to come to yoga because of the group and we call it Sangha. And it's such a powerful thing because you're going through the, if you're going through the process of dealing with your cancer, you get to meet other people and you get to share in this experience. And it's very powerful and it's of great benefit. So if you, you know, if you find a class wherever you're living, that's maybe in another center or in our center, you'll get to meet other people and develop a sense of Sangha and sharing while you practice. So I could talk on and on, but we might hand over now and learn a little bit more about the research. And what I would thank you so much, Margie, and I think um, we will have time afterwards. And I forgot to point out there's a Q&A button, so please feel free to write down your questions and we'll have about 20 minutes um, at the end where we'll be um, more of a dialogue and be able to have a discussion about yoga and answer some of your questions or and a bit of a discussion about yoga and if time a little bit more practice. Thank you very much, Margie. I'm going to uh, introduce you to Maria, who's going to um, show a small PowerPoint presentation and talk a little bit more about um, the hardcore research and evidence that supports yoga in practice. Thanks. Thanks, Judith. I will uh, start my sc uh, screen sharing. So just give me one moment. Now, uh, is that showing? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. So uh, as Judith and uh, Margie have mentioned, I'll be giving a brief overview of uh, the evidence uh, for yoga in uh, supportive care in cancer. Oh, one second. So yoga in the scientific and clinical communities is increasingly recognized as a complementary or integrative approach to diminishing the onset and severity of cancer related symptoms or indeed uh, treating these symptoms. The research to date has shown that the flexibility and acceptability of yoga among patients with cancer who are, who are undergoing treatment um, and into survivorship. So this means that people with cancer find that they can and are willing to undertake yoga programs. 
as you can see from the graph on the screen, that the number of published studies looking at yoga in cancer has risen dramatically since 1975 uh, on the left, uh, with only a couple of studies um, to 2017 uh, on the um, other side with about 60 studies. So it's really exciting to see the growth in the research in this area. Uh, and as a very uh, brief overview of the mechanism of action behind um, how yoga is thought to address cancer related symptoms and Margie touched uh, a bit on this, um, I'd like to take you through uh, this diagram on the screen. So the various techniques of yoga that you can see on the left hand side, such as breathing, meditation, physical postures and others, are thought to have a number of effects on different body systems. For example, the hyper hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, which is uh, what mediates the stress response, as Margie was talking about. Uh, also the circulatory and lymphatic systems and likely others as well. So the effects uh, then in turn are thought to act on a number of functions in the body uh, that are here depicted in the blue, such as the circadian function to uh, normalize uh, the rhythm, as well as a stress response to decrease cortisol, uh, on the physical function to increase cardiopulmonary function and muscular function, and also on the immune system to decrease pro uh, problematic pro-inflammatory markers and increase beneficial anti-inflammatory functions. So the overall effect uh, in the orange slash yellow um, of all these actions of yoga is to improve various cancer related symptoms like sleep disruption, fatigue, cognitive impairment, mental health, uh, and musculoskeletal symptoms such as joint and muscle pain. And indeed, it has been reported that people with cancer do take up yoga to manage these symptoms. For example, a very recent study um, from earlier this year in 507 participants with breast cancer found that they used yoga after their diagnosis to improve their overall wellness and relaxation or also for flexibility and balance, as well as to manage cancer related symptoms. So as you can see from the graph on the screen, that for all of the symptoms, including those mentioned in the last slide, like fatigue, sleep, joint and muscle pain, depression uh, and anxiety, as well as others like quality of life, lymphedema, peripheral neuropathy and nausea were all reported to be uh, improved following yoga practice. So in the black bars, you can see what uh, the level of symptoms were before uh, the participants um, practice yoga and in the white um, after their practice. So those bars are all um, a lower level of, level of symptoms. Um, and I have also carried out a survey in Australian participants uh, for my PhD uh, that, have, that were diagnosed with cancer and I actually found similar results to the benefits um, that they had seen from doing a yoga practice. So that was really nice to see as well. So those results are from people's reported experience with yoga and not formal trials. So then if we go into the evidence coming out of the trials of yoga programs, a review from uh, 2019 that looked at 29 randomized controlled trials, which of course are the gold standard way of measuring effects of treatment in research. Um, they reported the number of studies that had significant findings, that is that the symptoms improved after the yoga programs. So in the table on the screen, you can see that um, there are a number of cancer related symptoms uh, that they looked at, um, like quality of life, fatigue, pain, sleep, uh, different physical biomarkers, as well as psychological um, effects um, like anxiety, depression, distress and cognition. Um, and they've broken that down uh, into uh, participants that were undergoing treatment, um, that had finished treatment or were a mixture of both. Um, and I've added the totals there as well. So you can see the number of um, randomized control studies that have found positive results um, in this um, population. 
Um, and uh, just one thing to note as well is the number of studies um, will actually be higher now um, as there have been more conducted uh, for the various symptoms since this was published. Uh, and this study also looked at um, only included publications in English. So this is really um, an underrepresentation of the actual numbers um, that are out there. Uh, importantly as well, uh, based on the strength of the evidence that has been gathered to date, um, as Margie mentioned, clinical practice guidelines have been developed by the Society for Integrative Oncology and they've been endorsed by the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, these recommend yoga with other, either a high or moderate certainty of benefit for various symptoms, um, and this is specifically in women with cancer where the most evidence uh, exists. Uh, and these include for anxiety, depressive symptoms, fatigue, quality of life and sleep. Uh, and in addition, um, in 2020, so last year, the European Society for Medical Oncology also published guidelines um, that uh, said that uh, yoga could be an option to improve fatigue and quality of life. So this recognition of the evidence is really great to see. So while we have more and more positive evidence of the effects of yoga on cancer-related symptoms, there is still more work to be done to tease out the exact mechanisms and answer various questions. These include finding out more about which types of symptoms yoga is better at addressing if, if there are differences, um, and if the effects differ between different types of cancer or stages of cancer. Most studies so far have been done in women with breast cancer, so more research is needed uh, in other cancers. Uh, and one of the things I'm addressing in my PhD is what specific practices and techniques in yoga are best for helping with mental health symptoms. Uh, and I'm doing this through a Delphi study, which is a consensus study with yoga teachers and therapists. We also need to determine uh, the optimal dose for different symptoms uh, and which type of yoga is um, most effective. Uh, so because uh, studies so far have varied considerably uh, in the style and components taught. So we need more studies to investigate this further. Um, uh, but the, uh, it's definitely a practice that is more gentle than your average yoga class. As Margie mentioned, it, it, it is adapted to the needs um, and uh, barriers of, of people with cancer. Um, and that's what the trials to date have focused on. Uh, and lastly, we also need more information about how yoga is delivered. So for example, is it a group class or a one-on-one -on -one session? Uh, and this has been the focus of the research that one of my supervisors has done, uh, as well as mine in my PhD. Um, and we've been finding really interesting results there. Uh, and lastly, sorry, uh, very relevant to the times we are living in is looking at online delivery and whether that is effective as in person, um, and there have been some recent studies looking at yoga delivered online. Um, and this is also something that I'm looking at in my PhD, um, uh, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Um, but the research in that area as well um, is really looking quite exciting. So what does this all mean? Uh, based on the evidence we have so far, under proper guidance, yoga is a low risk practice. And I haven't talked uh, about the research behind this uh, because of time, but all the evidence points to yoga being a safe practice with very few um, injuries or other negative effects uh, in people with cancer. So it's a low risk practice that can be added to other treatments to combat cancer related symptoms during and after cancer treatment. And the evidence is robust and mounting for it being effective for a variety of these symptoms. And I'd just like to finish up uh, just mentioning a few studies that uh, we are conducting in the living room and uh, the, the research into uh, yoga and uh, research generally in the living room is, is growing um, at a rapid pace. So that's really great. Um, but the yoga studies that um, are happening at the moment is we've got a yoga for lymphedema study that we'll be recruiting very soon. And that's for women with breast cancer related lymphedema. And that's a 12 week online yoga program. 
So, and my PhD, which I've mentioned a few times, uh, I'm looking um, at a trial for uh, breast or gynecological uh, cancer patients with depression or anxiety symptoms. Again, it's an online yoga program for six weeks, and I'm looking at the group versus individual sessions. And we're also putting together an early breast cancer program, which is a specifically designed program to address a variety of symptoms uh, in women um, with early breast cancer, and yoga will be one component of these. Uh, and if you do want to find out uh, more information about any of these studies or any other studies, um, I've got my email address down below, and these um, will be available later uh, in the recording as well. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Sorry, Judith, you're, you're on mute. Maria, do you want to stop sharing your screen? And thank you very much. Um, so I think what we have heard is that there's a lot, there's a lot going on in this space. Uh, one of my colleagues from MD Anderson is uh, Lorenzo Cohen. Well, he's sort of more than he's a, a great teacher in the space and has really led the way in integrative oncology and yoga in cancer care is really involved in in a lot of the research in this space there's a lot of really interesting uh programs and uh a very a lot of interesting studies there's gary Deng at memorial sloan kettering looking at different types of yoga and the impact on uh brain derived nuclear bdnf which is um a factor that may improve or re impact on cognitive impairment related and, and sleep disturbances and fatigue related to um, cancer. And so it's a it's a it's fascinating how a simple what seems as a simple exercise uh, can make such a difference. And it's looking at where the origins of this exercise and uh, how that fits into yoga therapy that Georgina is going to now talk about. This is an ancient practice. You know, a lot of the therapies that are offered are now becoming part of mainstream delivery of wellness and uh, support for patients are based on ancient traditions like traditional Chinese medicine and Qigong and the practice from Ayurvedic medicine such as uh, yoga and yoga therapy. So uh, I'm going to introduce Georgina, who's going to take us back to some of those traditions and try and put this into context and then use a case of a patient, a patient's de-identified case, uh, to demonstrate how uh, a one-on-one -on -one yoga therapy uh, program can uh, benefit cancer patients. Georgina. Thanks, Judith. Um as Margie mentioned earlier, um, yoga was traditionally practiced one on one. And it was really only at the beginning of the last century when people from the West um, went to India that classes were developed. <clears throat> and most of you will be familiar with that idea of many people attending a large class with a teacher up the front and everybody following along as best they can. So in yoga therapy, we teach uh, yoga in small groups, but we also teach yoga therapy one on one. And this gives us a, a really good opportunity to tailor and customize the yoga practice so that the individuals um, get the best benefit. So today I'm going to talk you through a little bit about how we approach a one on one session. So I'll just open a short presentation. Um, let's see. I'll just go back. So <clears throat> I'll just quickly run you through the main tools we have in our kit bag as yoga therapists. And um, some of these words, of course, are from the Sanskrit. Um, so I've used them here because you might be familiar with them as well. But the main tool and, and one that most people are familiar with is asana or the body movements in yoga. And then there is pranayama or the breath work, um, which are often combined with, with body movements. 
and meditation or mindfulness. So you might be aware that there are lots of ways that you can meditate and yoga has its own system of meditation. And some of the other tools, this isn't a comprehensive list, but we also use chanting and sound or mantras to improve the breath and mental focus. We also use things like niyasam um, or mudras and gestures, often with the hands um, to support and focus attention on different parts of the body. And you might have seen people in yoga with their hands on their heart or even in a prayer position. And these kinds of gestures can be very powerful ways for people to access parts of themselves in their health journey that are, are difficult to articulate. And it's really important to say that within each of these tools, we have the ability to modify and modifica modifications in yoga therapy are really an important part so that we ensure that people don't move into pain or discomfort. We move in small incremental steps. So we progress the set step, stabilize and then progress further. And that way we see progress over time. So when we meet a person in um, an interview for yoga therapy, we look at them uh, holistically. One of the models that we use is called the Panchamaya, which is um, uh, looking at the different layers of our being. So kosha or mayas are layers or sheaths. Now, in yoga, we always move from the gross to the subtle. And in this model, the first layer is the body, the physical body. And here, if we meet some, when we meet somebody, we might be looking at how they move their body, if they have any injuries, perhaps recent surgery. We might look at whether their skin temperature is um, equal with their hands and their feet, or even the tone of their skin. So we can pick up a lot of information from that physical body. The next layer in this model is the pranamaya um, kosha. And here, this is the energetic body. In Sanskrit, the word prana means life force or breath. So it animates our mind and our body. And we can draw information from the way somebody is breathing, um, the way they're speaking, their general demeanor about their energy level. So it's not unusual to meet somebody who has, for instance, had a mastectomy guarding their chest and breathing into their upper body rather than using the full um, capacity of their breath. So all of these things contribute to this bigger picture. So now moving into the more subtle levels, manamaya, which is that mental um, thoughts and emotions, um, uh, some people are much more aware of that than others, um, but really it's about how we take experiences from the outside world and um, understand them in our own uh, mind and body. And then the last two, Vijnana Maya and Ananda Maya, much more subtle. Now Vijnana Maya is about wisdom. Um, some people talk about it being that deeper personality, um, but it's a difficult uh, layer to access for many of us. And in fact, in yoga, we access it through meditation and chanting. And then the last layer, Anandamaya, is that bliss state, that transcendental state, which we all aim for. Uh, not commonly available, but some people get glimpses of it in meditation. So how do we apply that approach? So in this summary of a case study, um, I'll talk you through how we might run the interview. So there are lots of ways to... Um, to approach yoga therapy with an individual. In this case, we had a 33-year-old young woman who came to me and her presenting problem, her hayam in Sanskrit, was um, that she had poor sleep despite fatigue. She felt weak and inflexible and her energy levels were very low and she wasn't very motivated. 
the cause or the HE2 in this case was daily radiation therapies for lymphoma. So the priorities um, for this woman were that she wanted to feel young, uh, stronger and more in control, less dependent. She was exhausted, particularly in the afternoon, but she couldn't nap then. She'd been using some meditation apps to try and help her to sleep, but with limited effectiveness. And she was concerned that the physical discomfort she'd felt in her throat and chest during the radiotherapy was going to worsen in the last rounds. Um, she also commented that her body felt very tight, her hamstrings, her neck. Um, and lastly, she mentioned that it was her birthday the next week, and that was coinciding with her last round of radiotherapy. So you can see here that there are clues already into some things that we might use to help this person develop a daily yoga practice. So on questioning, she was really open and keen to do something doable um, for herself. She loved dancing and snowboarding and Pilates before she got sick. So she already had a good sense of her body and movement. Um, and she responded really well to encouragement. She had a lot of faith in the health professionals that she'd been working with. So stepping back, um, she was relieved to be at home, um, really wanting to take some control herself. She had been drinking lots of water, but her appetite was very poor. Her family and her partner were really supportive, which was so important. Um, and she did already have a space at home where she had her yoga mat laid out. And she also mentioned in conversation, she had a ritual that she enjoyed to light a candle in the evening. So again, hints for me that this person would be um, very open to developing a regular practice. Um, in terms of touch therapy, she had been accessing through the living room massage and reflexology in earlier parts of her treatment, which she found very helpful. So for me, the methods and the tools um, were uh, using asana and pranayama, the body and the breath movements to increase energy in her chest, the prana vayu, and in her belly the apana vayu, um, which are energy centers, to improve her exhale and to help her with some yoga nidra as a form of meditation and relaxation. Now, this is just a very uh, short summary of the plan that we came up with. But essentially, there were two short practices, one in the morning and one in the evening, and some things for her to do during the day. So if I jump down to the bottom, during the day, um, she agreed that she would make herself a fresh juice every day as a start towards some independence. It was liquid um, and she knew that her appetite wasn't very good. Um, and she was going to spend some time organising her yoga space with favourite images and sounds. She was also going to start to try and find some time each day to play some music and to move gently to those sounds. So this is a person who was a dancer and got great joy from that before. In the morning practice, there was um, a very modified and simple asana practice, starting in lying and kneeling into standing. And we used a drishti, which is a, a focal point on her thumb to follow the movement with her hand to help release her neck, but also to increase her focus on the movements. Um, in the evening, there was a simple pranayama practice of alternate nostril breathing with, um, which we call Nadi Shodhana, followed by relaxation with an eye pillow and a recording of a yoga nidra meditation where we walked through her body and she was visualizing moving energy and prana into her major joints. And lastly, because her birthday was coming up, she decided she was going to buy herself a lovely gratitude journal um, to help her uh, coming out of her, her yoga treatment. So this is not an unusual uh, approach. Um, and of course, we follow up after this one-on-one -on -one um, interaction where we customise a practice to help people to 
uh, follow through and continue to practice. Lastly, there are some testimonials. There are so many, and it's really um, very uh, wonderful to hear them. Often people talk about connections back into their body um, and also connections into the group or sangha where they can just let everything down and be themselves in the room. They take off their beanies and, you know, feel very comfortable. Um, the emphasis and learning about breathing and relaxation um, helps people to calm themselves and feel less anxious. Um, and people also learn about how to manage specific symptoms and side effects like lymphedema. Um, and most say that they wish they had discovered yoga much earlier. Um, so that's it for me. Um, in the classes, of course, we, we modify more generally. Um, we really encourage the Sangha and, um, uh, yeah, sorry, that's it for me. I might hand back. I think my 10 minutes is done. Thank you very much, Georgina. That was absolutely beautiful and beautiful to um, just be taken on that journey that a patient will go through with, um, with both you and Margie. And now we have another yoga therapist uh, coming in, Liz, who will be starting with us as well. Um, there's a real emphasis on yoga therapists uh, being involved in cancer care. And I, that's a beautiful segue to some of the questions that we have. And please um, use the Q&A box to ask some questions. But we'll also, I'll facilitate a little bit of a discussion if there are no questions um, here, as I've got so many questions to ask. I'm so fascinated by yoga and yoga is a part of my uh, daily life as well. And as a clinician, it keeps me sane and um, hopefully fit. So the first question is from Leah. How do you distinguish between a yoga instructor and a yoga therapist? And how does one train to be a therapist and with whom here in Sydney? I'll hand that over to Margie or Georgina. Um, I, I'd like to jump in there. So yoga therapy requires um, some experience in teaching yoga prior to commencing the studies. And the studies uh, then move on from teaching yoga to applying yoga for specific health conditions. Um, and uh, if you're looking for a way to move into yoga therapy, I'd suggest that you go to the peak bodies of yoga. So Yoga Australia and the Australasian Association of Yoga Therapy who certify and accredit um, yoga trainers. Um, so you can really uh, see the whole kind of um, uh, scope of yoga therapy training. It's very satisfying for yoga teachers to do this. It's a, a new way to apply their skills. Margie, did you want to say anything? Um, no, no, just that I think that the, there'll be a growing emphasis. I think yoga therapy is kind of a, a new concept in, in our and our ideas of yoga and um, if you, when people hear the word, word yoga therapy, it sort, of, it sort of starts to click into them that, that maybe yoga can be applied for me, even though you know I can't attend a class in a gym or I can't stand on my head, that, that yoga, as Georgina so beautifully demonstrated through a case study, can be broken down and applied really for the individual. I... Um... Yoga is a really interesting space at the moment. I live in Bondi, so every second shop front has a yoga school. And there are different levels of yoga teachers and yoga um, practitioners that are teaching. And it's uh, what um, the Society for Integrative Oncology has decided, because this is similar for maybe to um, most many parts of um of the states such and the, the Society for Integrative Oncology did start in the states that they found something similar happening on the east and west coast of, um, of the US. And so there's a movement that people who are working in the cancer space are actually trained yoga therapists and developing your training programs for people who are interested, particularly in working in cancer. Because cancer care, cancer itself affects the body in different ways. Most of the studies have been done 
uh, in people with breast cancer, but people with cancer can have disease in their bones. They can have disease that affects their, their abdomen or uh, their neck or other parts of their body or multiple organs. And so it's really important for people who are specialized yoga therapists and specialized in um, working particularly with people with cancer, that there is this multidisciplinary review of the patient, that there's an understanding of what goes on uh, for the person so that treatment, um, a therapy can be personalized. And then that person can take that personalized program into a general class that is often coordinated by a, um, a yoga therapist with that spec that works with cancer patients, but with a group. So as part of our um, yoga program at Lifehouse, we screen people. So people don't just come rock up to a class and join in. We get a, a background um, of any recent surgeries, what types of treatment they have, do an in-depth sort of screening process. And then we decide maybe it's suitable for them to have an individual session first, which most people really appreciate and enjoy. We can give them um, some practices as Georgina's um, shown in her case study, or they can go straight into a class. So some people can go straight into a class, but it's that screening process that helps ensure that we keep people safe and give them the best effective yoga practice for their particular situation. And I'd also add too that, um, you know, uh, yoga is, has been drawn from the Vedas, a huge ancient body of work um, from a Vedic science perspective. There are um, a multitude of ways that people can come into yoga. So you might come in through um, wanting to move your body or do something with your body, but if you're very sick in bed, it doesn't mean that you can't do yoga. We can start with the breath or some people are really interested in finding out about the words we use in yoga. So we might introduce them to the yoga sutras, which are the um, kind of uh, teachings of yoga that were systemized from the Vedas. There's just an infinite number of ways to um, enter into yoga and to practice yoga. It's not limited to any one way. And I guess for yoga teachers who have become yoga therapists, that can be really exciting to be able to apply your knowledge um, in very innovative ways. And when I was quite young, everybody, uh, there was this sense that yoga was connected to religion in some way. And I know that um, there's, a, there's a great, uh, I suppose you could call it a secularization of yoga and mindfulness to uh, have it as actually a therapy. Mm. Um, so it's... Mm. Uh, even though we talk about the Vedas and we use Sanskrit words, they are the words that are so descriptive of yoga based on the Ayurvedic tradition, but it is not a, um, a spiritual, it can be a spiritual practice for some, but it is a secularized uh, practice mm. adapted to um, the modern day world. Mm. Is that a reasonable thing to say? Yeah, and I think that you can separate spirituality from religion as well. Um, but for some people, spirituality is, um, it's not an important part of the yoga journey. And it doesn't mean that you have to um, kind of try and access that part of yourself to get the benefits of yoga. So it has so many different entry points. For those that do, though, who um, enjoy or start to understand that they're more than their body, that they're also their mind, their body, and their spirit. Um, it can be quite a revelation. Maria, the um, work you're doing in anxiety and depression and stress and yoga um, connects very much to the spirit of a person. Do you want to talk a little bit or about that or add something to that um, comment by Georgina? Oh. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I can address that from a research perspective, um, but yes, definitely um, that, that's a big, uh, well, it, it can be for some people a part of, of what that, that side of, um, you know, the, the psychological side of um, their, their being um, is and, and um, yeah, but it's definitely something that um, 
I'm looking at um, in my PhD and exploring with people and their experiences uh, with that side of things. It's very interesting. And why do you think anxiety is one of the most common symptoms that um, people experience during um, with the diagnosis of cancer, particularly uh, early on, but also if they have progressive disease? How does yoga work to improve? What's the theory behind um, how yoga improves um, anxiety for people? Is it the actual movement, the breath work? Margie touched on it with the stress response and the parasympathetic system. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's uh, the, it, there's definitely a, a, a theory um, that it, part of it is biological. So it's the action on um, the hypothal hypothalamic pituitary axis that um, works to decrease that stress response and dampen all of that down and decrease cortisol and reduce stress and, and in turn and anxiety. Um, and there's also the, so that's sort of the, what we call the bottom up um, mechanism of action. So that's starting in the body and that has an effect uh, on the mind. And there's also the, the top down. So starting from the mind and um, the effects that yoga has on, uh, on the mind itself. Um, also, uh, the psychological effects themselves can actually um, directly address the anxiety as well. So it's really nice that it works in both those ways. What I find is that once people take on yoga and find some benefit with it, then they continue. It's, it's a little bit of a journey. And, and as, as Georgina was highlighting, it, it takes us to a place, um, despite what's going on in our external environment, stresses and things that we can't control, it takes us to a place where deep inside we can find that equanimity or peace or joy. Um, and and that's, that's really keeps people coming back because it, it's quite a powerful um, place to tap into, a place we all have within us. Yeah. And I, what is um, quite, I find quite interesting if I am feeling stressed, just do, using yoga breath work, the pranayam, and using diaphragmatic breathing. And so maybe just to use the breath to be relaxed enough to even practice or function is actually um, quite amazing. And there's a lot of research at the moment on the vagus nerve and its relationship with anxiety, but also wellness. And I know yoga is very... Um, talks a lot about the impact of breath and some of the asanas on um, the vagus nerve. Did anyone want to make a comment? Um, I would only just say that there's a lot of interest in yoga circles about the vagus nerve and it's a very large nerve. It wanders throughout the body. So I think we're only beginning now to um, appreciate how we can uh, impact on vagal tone uh, through the breath. Um, but one of the really valuable things is that in yoga, we learn to integrate body, mind and breath in a practice. And I forgot to mention that we will put a link um, on the recording of this session when it's distributed to a 12 minute practice about integrating both body, mind and breath and influencing your vagal tone as well. It's quite exciting and there are all these ads for vagal nerve stimulators for people with chronic gut problems and, um, and different um, symptoms. So it's a very interesting space to watch. Are there any other questions? Um, there are no other questions from the Q&A. If anyone wants to ask a question, either oh, here's a question now. Um, it's wonderful that yoga therapy is being offered alongside existing treatments at Lifehouse to address patient suffering, enable patients to care for themselves through the many challenges of the cancer journey. Hats off to you all involved. What are some of the ways we can see we can see take up of this and other supportive care therapies within the Lifehouse environment? Mm. 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 The ways that we can see it is really to engage people. What we have seen is that um, our therapies and our therapists are very busy and um, one response to that is that we're developing um, packages of care and programs of care. And one 
group, we know that most of the evidence sits in the early breast cancer space, for example. And so people with breast cancer, um, we know that there's quite high level, actually level A evidence that yoga improves anxiety and relaxation response in patients. And there's quite high level evidence in a paper uh, published in 2018 in the General Clinical Oncology, which is one of the um, top journals in the cancer space, suggesting uh, the benefit of yoga also for sleep disturbances, uh, cognitive and cognitive fog and fatigue. And the cognitive fog component is really tricky. So um, I won't say, we can't say that yoga improves um, the fogginess that people experience, but it can adapt some of the mechanisms that contribute to cognitive fog. And so what we're trying to do is say, well, what if we provided a package of care that people could do, a, a workshop or a program, um, would that engage people more easily to develop a skill and empower you to continue afterwards? But actually, we also find that people, once they start in a program, really hard to get them to leave because it is such a it becomes part of your daily life. And having practiced for yoga for 20 years myself, more than 20 years, I, I feel a, that I'm missing a part of myself if I don't practice. And so it is really important to acknowledge that what we're trying to do in the living room and in our services is to give people skills that they can continue for the rest of their lives. Mm. Um, there's anyone else want to comment? I think that's, oh, that's, no. that's well said, yeah. <laughs> well said. Um, another uh, comment here is I'm a huge fan of yoga through my life, throughout my young adult living, my successful attempt to have twins now has helped me to live life to full with multiple myeloma. Thanks so much to the panel for providing research and experience that validates the value of yoga so all can get on board on the mat. And I think <laughs> it's... Um, independent of um, the cancer and multiple myeloma disease that can affect the bones significantly. Um, independent of what you have, we have the, the skills and the capacities as the doctor in the service, I'll often evaluate someone before referring them on. We have a nurse care coordinator who will assess people prior to them being uh, referred to an evidence-informed practice that best suits that person's needs. And also we have exercise physiologists that will do a one-on-one -on -one assessment. Everyone really needs a personalized uh, exercise program and a mind-body program. And so that will ensure that uh, they modify. For example, if someone has disease in their spinal cord, we don't want them doing twists. And if somebody has a fracture risk in uh, a certain bone, need to modify the practice that it may be seated yoga or chair yoga and breath work. And so what we're really keen to do is um, provide uh, solutions to everyone. Um, and to increase uptake um, is also a really important, um, I think the ways we're addressing, the question was how are we addressing ways to increase that uptake and maybe, um, anyone would like to make a comment there? Maria, you can talk, I think, about in, inter, integrating research into practice um, and some other ways we're looking at increasing uptake for um, yoga. Yes, we're definitely having, um, having the research uh, side of things and um, the variety of research, if we can um, get, you know, lots of different programs happening, that's I think a really nice entry point for people and um, research studies are free. So that's, that's really great. And, um, you know, can, can introduce people and hopefully keep them going on that journey as well. And so um, I just realized we're out of time so quickly. I am. Uh, and thank you very much to Gail, who said, uh, who asked the question, is yoga therapy being offered to patients on the wards at the moment at LifeHouse? It is anything is possible, Gail O'Brien, <laughs> who is our patient advocate here at LifeHouse, the wonderful Gail O'Brien. 
uh, anything is possible. And we're looking at offering um, yoga and seated yoga to patients while they're receiving chemotherapy and day therapy. And I think there is always there are always opportunities to offer one-on-one -on -one yoga practice to patients on on the ward. And as um, we engage more with people and see the benefits of yoga therapy, of breath work, of simple movement, um, we do we can offer those uh, therapies at any time to patients on the ward. So that's so. Thank you, Gail, for. Um, recommending and suggesting that and I think Margie's done a few practices yeah we, we're, we're very happy to go onto the wards if people people want to have a simple breathing practice a relaxation or um you know just to kind of be there and provide whatever yoga is appropriate um let us know give us some feedback that's the the hour is up I'd like to thank um Margie, Maria, and Georgina for sharing their wisdom. This will be taped and be uh, distributed to all of those people who uh, signed up, but also on our uh, our website and our YouTube channel. The um, next webinar will be about in looking at living well after cancer, and that will be looking at um, what some people call survivorship care, but we call um, living well after cancer and uh, or living well with cancer, with advanced cancer. Uh, as we know, as we change the, um, the ability to keep people living longer with cancer, we really need to put effort into keeping them living well. And so we'll be, uh, you'll hear from one of uh, a medical oncologist, Ash Malala Sakara, who uh, specializes in um, survivorship and works with us in our new Living Well Beyond Cancer Clinic, which is held on a Monday. Um, Kim Karen Ayres, our uh, nurse care coordinator here in the living room who uh, specializes in um, survivorship care and life after cancer. I'll be joining them and we'll have some other speakers as well. And the most, and so that's the next webinar and that will be uh, in a uh, later on in July and we'll look forward to sharing the dates. We'll also be sharing our uh, parts and full parts of this um, webinar and thank you uh, online. And thank you very much, Margie, Maria, Georgina for your time, for your expertise, for all that you contribute to uh, Lifehouse and to the living room and to the care of patients here. And I know that um, from the testimonials and from the feedback, people, once they engage, they, um, they just know that this is for them and has made a difference and can make such a difference to their life with and beyond cancer. So thank you everybody.